Welcome back to week two of Solace Sessions. We have six new pieces to entertain you this evening. So sit back, relax and enjoy Solace Sessions. He looked very solemn in death. Not at all like the Jack that'd be down on the pub on a Saturday night buying pints for the whole country. I had a fierce job getting his eyes to stay shut. And as for his gaping mouth, I thought I'd have to use super glue on the lips. It's hard to see a man I was at school with in one of my coffins, even though he spent the entire sixth class kicking me under the desk when the teacher wasn't looking. <laughs> it's hard to believe that that was 50 years ago. Do you know, when we were young lads, if we knew how our lives had turned out, would we have bothered at all? Anyway, that's what I was thinking when I was talking to Jack's father the night before the funeral. Will you take cash, he said, hunching his shoulders and looking at the oak coffin that I'd just shown him. I had to think for a minute before I answered him. Most people talk, don't talk about paying until after the funeral is over. Ah, no need to worry about that, I said. I was keeping the money for my own funeral, for Jack to bury me. What was the man above thinking when he took him first, he said. I rubbed my hand along the edge of the coffin, not knowing how to answer that. Uh, sorry, look, I, I've nothing smaller, but I, I'll have some on Friday if you, if you want to wait. No, it, it's a perfect size. Perfect, I said, thinking of Jack's scrawny body. Uh, Julius and Caesar will fit in nicely, one on each side of him. I lifted my hand off the coffin and leaned towards him, expecting to get the smell of whiskey off his breath. Poisoned they were. Jack was awful depressed when he found them both dead in the field at the back of the house the day before he died. He always said he wanted his dogs buried with him. Well, I've had some requests in my life, but none of, but none of them, the best of them, this beats them all hands down. <laughs> and put the lid on the coffin for the wake. Can't have the neighbours looking at him. Jack's face had hit concrete when he fell. Or jumped. Not sure exactly, and it's not something I'd ask his father. 
I, I done my best to make him look presentable. You won't charge me for the dogs, will you? Oh, God, no. Thanks. I don't care what they say about you. You're a decent skin. You know Jack's heart wasn't able to do what he was doing at. That ghost estate at the edge of the town killed him. There was no way he was ever going to sell all those houses. His words fell into an angry silence as he struggled to keep his hard man's face from cracking. A tear sneaked out and hung off the cliff of his cheekbone. I knew better than to touch him. Must be six months ago since I touched Maureen. Reached my hand across the space between us in our big king-sized bed. Under the crumpled sheets or over her right thigh, you don't have to, she said, her stiff back facing me. Her voice chased away my eager hand and I looked at it for a moment to see what was wrong with it. And then, then the snooze button went off. She didn't move. No gentle shove out of the bed like there used to be. I, I can't remember how long ago that stopped. I thought maybe she didn't want me near me because of the operation on my prostate. If that had been it, I, I might have understood. The front door of the funeral home slammed just as I was about to straighten Jack's tie. And Maureen burst into the viewing room. What, what are you doing here, I said. Something's wrong with my credit card. I was in town this morning, saw a lovely pair of heels, and the ca card got declined. Ah, I must have forgotten to pay the bill. You never forget. Well, it's always the first time. This isn't funny. She was about to start one of her rants when she looked to see who was in the coffin. The surface of the rant gave way to tears and she fumbled into her handbag for tissues, the bag with the guess label on it. Those shoes must have been something, I thought. What's Jack doing here? I, I, I thought his funeral wasn't until tomorrow. Are they not going to wake him in the house tonight? No. His father wanted all over and done as quick as possible, straight to the church from here this evening. And what the hell are his dogs doing in there, she said, stumbling towards the coffin. Her tissues weren't providing much soakage for her tears. She started stroking his tie. It's a bit creased, she said, her voice creaking. Oh, she never noticed my creased shirts that lay in the laundry bag for days. I used to have to bring, end up having to bring them to the laundrette. She told me that she hated ironing after we were married. <laughs> Still, she was a great cook, always out trying out new recipes. Green curries, red curries, ragouts, sweet and sour, you name it, we had it. <laughs> You never knew what I'd get for dinner, but it was always tasty. I'll miss that. She started to finger the buttons on his suit jacket. Maureen, his family will be here soon. It wouldn't look too good for you to be here crying. Yeah, yes, you're right, she said, bending down to kiss him on the forehead. Ah, Jesus, Maureen, there's no need for that. She looked at me and, and I didn't know what was in her eyes. The fact that they were both half closed and full of tears didn't help. She came over to where I was standing on the other side of the coffin. And for a minute, I thought she was looking for a hug. And you know, I didn't nearly give her one. I cancelled the card, I said. Why? The bank ran me last week for the third month in a row. You've been over the credit limit. Well, that, that never seemed to bother you before. Business has never been better, and, and it's not as if you can take it with you when you're in a wooden box like poor Jack. I've been checking the visa statements, bills for hotels we've never stayed in. My, my voice was getting a bit, a bit too high for a funeral home. 
She took her hand off Jack's body and used it to rub her eyes. So? Are you going to tell me who it is, I asked. She sneaked a quick look at Jack's face, but, but I caught her. It's him, isn't it? Or should I say, it was him, I said, saliva hitting her in the face as I spat the words out. It's, it's over now, she said, turning to walk away. I grabbed her arm and the blood left her face. It would have frightened myself as much as her with a tight grip, but only the picture of her and him in the black Audi was, was tormenting me. If, if she had apologised or, or offered some sort of excuse, that might have helped calmed me down. I, I, I'm too upset to talk about this now anyway. I, I told Jack last week that I couldn't see him anymore, she said, try, trying to pull her arm from my hand. And is that supposed to make everything all right? So what are we supposed to do now? Kiss and make up? Forget this ever happens? <laughs> I was shouting and laughing at the same time, but I didn't loosen my grip. She didn't answer. And to be honest, honest, I don't think it would have done much good even if she had. It's funny, but I can never recall what happened next. All I remember is thinking how they were a perfect fit, herself and Jack Costello. Her warm corpse clung to his as I screwed on the lid of the coffin. It was a difficult job getting it shut. My, my heart was thumping and my hands were shaking. I managed to squeeze the guess handbag between Jack's shoes. I had to take the two dead dogs out of the coffin so there'd be enough space for Maureen. The weight of them nearly killed me as I dragged him out the back to put them in the boot of the car. I'd bury them later in the garden, under her rose bushes. I put the photo that Jack's niece had brought in on the coffin, on the lid of the coffin, and sat down in the chief mourner's chair to clear my dizzy head. The shock of it all had ripped through my body like a tornado. But I steadied myself, which was no mean feat, given the circumstances. And then I put on my undertaker's face, stood up, left the room, and locked the funeral home's door behind me. I badly needed a pint before the wake. refurbishment. They told me it would look like this, and frankly, I didn't believe them. How could I, when scaffolding held up the arches and the sharp buzzing of distant machines and echoed chambers was like your voice downstairs asking if I wanted anything from Londis. 
Now everything is colour coordinated. The ceiling is vaulted. And it does me good to walk around on carpets that make you forget you're standing on pure granite. The stained glass window in the lobby gives off its delusion of light. I remember when its ledge was filled with dust that dropped from the ceiling, the sort that would dance above your unmade bed on mornings months ago, while I sat on the edge of it, listening to you sing in the shower. to wear a wig. My dad. It was the 1970s. A lot of men did. Even his big hero Frank Sinatra had one. Bobby Charlton never though, and he probably should have. My dad was a concreter at the shipyard, and damn proud of it. All day he'd mix sand and cement and water, and pour it across the floor until he could play bloody snooker on it. He was strong as hell. He could crush your fingers if he shook your hand. There's a picture of my dad, older brother John, sister Sherry and me, when we were kids in our backyard one summer afternoon. I was about five. We all have our tops off and we're flexing our muscles like bodybuilders. Dad must have been in his mid thirties and he looked great, like a, a hungry boxer. Well, his body did. His hair looked like it'd been badly stuck on with glue which it was. <laughs> You're very sensitive about the wig. Our mam had it drilled into us as kids not to laugh or make fun of it. We weren't even allowed to mention it. When his hair got too long at the back and sides, our mam would cut it, dye it, and try to stick it on the wig. It never worked. You could see from miles where the wig ended and my dad began. I remember the first time I was embarrassed by it, and him. I was 11. My mum had left my dad by then and taken John and Shirley and me with her. I was going on a school trip to Lansdowne Road to watch the Ireland schoolboys. And it was what people these days might call a lads and dads day out. All the other kids were on the bus with their fathers, ready to go. But there was no sign of mine. I was sitting down near the back and everyone was waiting for him. Then finally, he came running to the bus, got on and made the slow walk down the aisle to me. Everyone was staring at him. I could see some of the boys covering their mouths, trying not to laugh. And I knew what was going on. And then, just before he sat down, Kevin Gallagher on the back seat shouted at the top of his voice, WIG! And that was it. The whole bus erupted. I can't even remember what my dad's reaction was, but I know that not long after that, he stopped wearing it. It always troubled me that I never stood up for him and that I was embarrassed by him on that school trip. I was just too young, I guess. I was thinking about that this morning. I was in the cafe, the one where I used to go to with my dad when he had us kids on Saturdays. 
I go there now at the weekend to do my horses and have a brew. Anyway, the radio was playing this morning and Sinatra came on. God, my dad loved him. Obsessed even. He got such joy from his music. It used to take him to another place. He even signed our birthday cards with love from Frank Sinatra. <laughs> it's funny how music can stir memories and emotions. It even got me thinking about my dad and his wig, just like old blue eyes. And it got me thinking about the last time I saw him. He was in hospital. 30 years of breathing in cement dust, asbestos, God knows what else in the shipyard, had left him with mesothelioma. He was only 72. But over the last five years of his life, his breathing had got worse and worse and worse until eventually it stopped. When I saw him on that last day, he couldn't speak anymore. And he was wearing a ventilator. I don't even know if he knew I was there. It was when iPods had just come out and I bought mine and stuck his favourite song on it. Summer Wind by Sinatra. I stretched over him, trying not to dislodge the, the tubes and wires and put the buds in his ears. When I pressed play, it was miraculous. His eyes opened wide. He had a half smile on his face and his head sank back into his pillow. And then, slowly, he began to raise his hands. He put out his left and right index finger and began to slowly conduct the orchestra his finger swaying from side to side in midair. I don't know who or where or what he was thinking about, but for those three blissful minutes, he was taken to a different, better world. When the song ended, he closed his eyes. That was the last time I saw him. Nobody knows when it started. The only point certain is we must visit the Blessed Well on the 8th day of August of each year. The virtues obtained from attendance are the calamities to befall the non-attenders. It's all a bit vague. Well, it's unclear to me, but I believe that Mother knows the rules exactly. The whole business worked very well, except when I was 12. Even then, nothing happened until midday. I remember saying the Angelus, with Mother leading the chant and me reciting responses. The angel of the Lord appeared to Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Ghost. Then Daddy walks in and says Pat Tusco is coughing. What is the impact of 
the calfing of a cow belonging to Patool, you might ask. It's actually our best cow. But they always name cows after the previous owner. Now you see the potential impact on the day of our pilgrimage to the Blessed Well. And that same impact is clearly visible on the face of my mother, who knows every blessed consequence of not attending religiously to duties. The impact is also clearly visible on the face of my father. He doesn't know the consequences of non adherence to rituals, but he knows the magnitudes of calving cows left unattended. He remembers what happens to Black Josie's cow. That would be our cow that we bought from Pat Black Josie for £65. I see the jolt on both faces and I offer help. I will watch the cow and if anything happens, I will run down for my Kamali and he will attend the mess of Cathbert. <clears throat> the lines on my father's forehead straighten. But I see an increase in the impact of the face of my mother. You made your confirmation, Sarsons, and you must attend the blessed well, she says, without ever seeing the need to tell me the consequences. Then my father offers his solution, and the words move in his mouth with all the care of an ass eating thistles. You know it will not work. Not with mother, even before she speaks. And how could you even think of not going to the blessed well? Yes, my father knows it is useless to pursue this potential solution. He might as well have suggested putting the cow up on the carrier of his black rally all steel bicycle and taking it with him. Already people are cycling past in twos and threes. Occasionally, even a motor car whizzes past, probably carrying frail old people beyond their years of cycling, but who also know and fear consequences. I wonder what the rules say about the lovely sandwiches Mother has prepared. Mother hates waste, but rules are rules. Could we eat sandwiches intended for the Blessed Well pilgrimage of August the 8th, in the middle of a green field, while watching the birth rituals of a cow, sick for the want of caffeine? Mother's solutions are best. Because isn't it always Mother's solutions that we follow in our house? No surprise then when she offers one. Go down to the field and see how far gone the cow is, she instructs Daddy. See if she is lying and rising the incline of the bones and look for any sign of a hoof appearing. She signs off by saying we might yet make it there and back before she calves. That's all right, I'm thinking. But what about the sandwiches? We always eat the sandwiches after the prayers. And if we have to rush home to a sick cow? My father relays the veterinary report from the field indicating that Pat Two's cow's calf would soon be another tongue twister added to the farm roll book. A change in mother's face tells me she is struck by the blinding light of all-knowing wisdom. I can see a relief from the impact of a crisis on her. And it is clear the final solution has arrived. We must stay home and attend to the cow. She issues instructions in my direction. She follows Daddy back to the field. Get the rope and follow us down, she said. At 12 years of age, no further rope explanations are necessary. You know it is the one with the two slip knots for attachment to the little front feet to pull the calf free from the labouring cow. A boy of confirmation age also knows that you do not allow every thought in your head to become words. But they splutter from my mouth anyways. Will I bring the sandwiches? I ask. But get about your belly. She shouts over her shoulder and she is gone. The sandwiches stay in the shopping bag in the carrier of my mother's high nelly. And I get the robes. I arrive in the field just in time to allow Daddy to attach the slip knots to the two front feet of the calf. Before you could say, fine bull calf, the job is done. And Pat Tool's cow lies licking the shining pelt of her new offspring with his tongue hanging down. My tongue is hanging out too for a couple of the Blessed Well sandwiches. And that's when I learn about consequences. 
Mother Nature helps to break the news gently by blowing the brown paper bag that lately held sandwiches in our direction. The dog. And I'm running towards the house. But it's little that dog cares for a boy tonight's sandwiches intended for the blessed well in the year of his confirmation. It's all right for mother and daddy. They have delivered the calf that might have come wrong if they had gone to the blessed well. Their tails are up, as mother would say, because mothers can see tails on people. I can't see people's tails, though I'm sure mine hangs down at the back, between my legs. Just like that dog disappearing around the gable of our house. The week off. As soon as I come downstairs, I can tell it's the week off. I'm not just saying because it's very dark and I'm afraid. I know the smell from the dark. It was a smell you could taste. There is a feeling to the dark, like the old velvet jacket, the, what, the one that got wet when the dog peed on it, after Granny gave to us for dressing up. But I'm only eight, and I don't know now what to do when the week is off. If Mam was up, she would know. Like the way she takes fish from the fridge and says straight away, that's a fish off. She would then drop it in the bin. But you can't drop a whole week in the bin. I sit on the bottom step to think. I'm sure there's a smell from the week off on my clothes. I close my eyes and stroke the wet velvet. I smack my lips together several times. And it tastes like the smell of Granny's house. When I got to eight, I was allowed to make my own breakfast. I usually get cereal from the press and milk from the fridge. Or sometimes I make toast and I'm sure not to burn myself. But I don't know now. I should have listened to Mom properly. Last night she was talking to Dad about it. What are you going to do with the week off? Dad asked. I'm just going to stay in bed, is what she said. But I was busy using 20 best apps that help your kid get smart. Which Mom had downloaded for me. And didn't ask what I should do with the week off. If the week is off? So I mean, everything is off. But if Mam stays in bed, who will know what to drop in the bin? I don't think Dad knows. I think that ham is off. Mam would say, "Ah, it's fine." And Dad would continue making a sandwich, and Mam would move her shoulders, the way adults do. Then I started wondering if people could be off. I've gone right off her. Mam would say about a friend. And then she would find another, until she went off. I'm lucky, because my bestest friend has never gone off. I wouldn't like it if she was stinky the way it is now, with the week off. Then I thought of my dog, Alfie. He is white, and Mam says he is a Bichon. She wrote it down, and I learned to spell it. He sleeps in the utility room, and has a star barking, like he usually does, when the first person comes into the kitchen in the morning. Maybe he's very tired. Or maybe he's gone off. I don't really know what to, when, what to do when the week is off. So I start making up prayers. First I pray to Holy God. And then to the Tooth Fairy. And then to Santa. I sit on the step and wait for the prayers to work. Now if he starts marking, barking mad. But the week off ran around me. I stay where I am. Mam comes out on the landing. And when she looks over the banisters. She sees me sitting on the last step. Millie, what are you doing sitting in the dark at six o'clock in the morning? She says, and then she comes downstairs in her dressing gown. Just one week off where I don't have to get up early for work. When was the last week off? She asked me, but I don't remember. She also passed me to let the dog out so that he will stop barking. It's just this week off, ma'am? I ask as I follow her. Of course it's the only week off. Next week is back to normal. Mam is very cross. But I'm glad that the week off will finish on Sunday. Then Dad comes out on the landing because of the dog barking mad. Mam shouting like crazy. So much for a line of the week off. 
she says up to him. He leans on the banisters and yawns. Is that the best thing to do with the week half, ma'am? Just stay in bed until it goes away? Yes, unless you get taken off the somewhere the sun is shining all the time, she says, looking up at Dad. Dad moves his shoulders and then goes back to bed, scratching his bum. The way he tells me not to. Go back to bed, Millie, she says as she follows Dad. I pick up Alfie and go to my bed. When I sniff Alfie, he smells fine, so I pull the covers over her heads and hide from the wee calf. I am there at my mother's birth. I watch from the cosmic waiting room as she struggles into life. She kisses me before she leaves and reassures me that we will be reunited somewhere in the mystery of time. The thought of me will comfort her on her journey through the veil of sorrow that tests all souls. I resolve then that I will be the healing balm that restores her. And though she will forget for me once born, I will stay with her. Through all the times that she feels alone, I will be a gentle presence all around her. She chooses a mission of truth and integrity, the most difficult one. I watch as her voice and being are repressed by institutions and worldly corruption. Nevertheless, she holds on to the truth within her and is guided through all manners of hell by it. In her worldly body, she reasons that compassion is the only true way. The only worthwhile use of life is to care for those around you to help them understand and deal with their pain. For she knows that is the only way to survive one's own pain. The struggle within the world causes her to question all that shapes it. She spends years observing, reading, arguing, debating. Her work always for social justice. She understands the power of the word and the story and works in social theatre, exposing the theatre going set to the reality of poverty, illness and lack of power. And their audiences laugh and cry and laud the effort. Their cosy complacency returns when they retire to the nearest hostelry to eat whatever peasant fare is fashionable at the time. They are years of laughter and dance. The eternal summer of youth and possibility. Her soul is light and free. So much so, she frightens those who have a vested interest in human misery. Unwittingly. Using every manner and means to corrupt her, Without success, they finally label her mad. 
They burn her brain and dispense medications to keep her docile and under control. They're so successful that she even believes it for a while. She realises it's just another power game and she fights for her mind with all her being. She challenges the status and knowledge of doctors who view people pragmatically, not giving their experience any credence. She emerges victorious, but feels honour bound to aid others. She writes her story to benefit all. You may well wonder how I fare watching this. I don't like to see my mother suffer, but then I'm unborn and still in touch with the unity of the universe. And I know that living in truth is its own reward, despite the cost. Her greatest challenge is the struggle within her own heart. Energy invested in others gives her little time to consider her own need for love. Her deepest wish to meet me and raise me a happy child eludes her time and time again. Never seems to realise itself, though there are contenders. She becomes a teacher, shaping the destiny of hundreds of children, but silently grieving that she has none to call her own. In her inner world, she imagines holding her own newborn. She hides the pain in laughter and becomes a fairy mother to many children in her path who need love and understanding. Her own wish becomes dim. The end of this dream finally breaks her heart and she goes into free fall. Losing all direction, she finds herself floating in chaos, directionless, drifting. She's no idea that I am holding her from disappearing into oblivion. I direct her home to begin again. And to finally meet me.